Hello, everyone, and welcome to another Things We Said Today, our weekly roundtable of discussion of the Beatles past, present, and to come, we hope. I'm Steve Marinucci, author of the Beatles Examiner and several columns on examiner.com. And I will introduce my three co-hosts. First, uh, out in uh, the Pennsylvania area, there's uh, Mr. Al Sussman, executive editor of Beatle Fan Magazine. Hello, Al. Hi, Steve. Hello there, everybody. And in Connecticut, we have the host of the Beatles show, Every Little Thing, Ken Michaels. Hello, Ken. Hey, Steve. Hi, everyone. And up in beautiful Maine, actually, I, I shouldn't say that because I've never been there, but I'll, I'll say it's beautiful because <laughs> I'm sure it is. We have our, our musicologist and, and Beatle expert who wrote all those great articles about George Martin, uh, Mr. Alan Cosen. Hello, Alan. Hey, Steve. Hello, everyone. And it is beautiful. It is beautiful. (laughs) Yes, Mm -hmm. it is. Anyway, um, we thought we're kind of um, playing it by ear today. We're going to kick around some uh, um, loose discussion. We're going to talk about a few news items and then we're going to then we're going to try something uh, um, hopefully fun at the end. Um, There's been a a couple of things going uh, this week um, that if you've been following the internet writings that I've been doing that uh, and that have other people have been doing that you probably heard about Paul McCartney. It's been confirmed. It's been reported by several legitimate outfits that Paul McCartney has made an effort to try and get his Beatles song copyrights back. Um, everybody's kind of been hoping that he would be able to, and really he, he he's the whole the question is really limited because he can't get them all back, um, you know, um, but he can, starting in 2018, he can get some of the Lennon and McCartney songs in America only. He can't get them outside of America. And so we thought we'd kick that around for uh, just a little bit. Um, Alan, let me, I'm going to start with you. Yeah, because, you, you know, um, it, this is actually not a big surprise. I think it's coming up now just because um, – the story of Sony, a Sony buying out Michael Jackson uh, or his estate um, is in the news, and it always, whenever that catalog is mentioned, the question of can Paul McCartney get his songs back always comes up. But mm-hmm. a few years ago, in an interview, someone raised the question about whether he was trying to get them back or whatever, and he said, "Well, you know, I mean, I don't really have to because in a few years." it won't matter, you know, he'll have them anyway. And it was a little cryptic, as remarks go, for people who don't know the details of the copyright law. But the copyright law is, you know, you get two 28-year terms on published music, and then the rights can revert back to the creator. So that 56 years is coming up for the Mm -hmm. earliest part of the Beatles catalog really soon. And and he, um, well, you've reported and and other people have as well that he's already got his applications in to get that in. And that seems to me pretty clearly what he was talking about when he said that. So in a way, you know, if you follow that kind of thing, it's not really a big surprise. And also, um, you know, for us as listeners, while it's kind of nice to think that Paul McCartney, who owns so many great composers' catalogs but not his own, will finally get his back. Um, you know, in practical terms, it doesn't actually do anything either way for us. You know, I mean, we we still buy the records, we still listen to the records, nothing changes except knowing that he owns them, which is, I guess, nice. But it's it's sort of like a technical detail. It doesn't really matter that much to those of us who aren't Paul McCartney or or Yoko. You know, um, mm-hmm. I, I guess there's um, when you say uh, that he can't get them all back. Are, are you talking about just the timing aspect that the fifty six years applies only to? you know, the beginning of the catalog, but eventually he gets them all back or? Well, I mean, my understanding is that it only applies to U.S. to, to US copyright. Oh, not yeah. To... Huge market, though. Right. Mm-hmm. But, yeah, it, it, we're not talking about the entire world here. Um, we I was world. actually, <laughs> well, well, yeah, I was actually surprised that Sony was able to buy Jackson's estate out. I, I didn't, I uh, didn't mm, I think, think that would. I thought Michael Jackson actually owed Sony a whole lot of money, yeah, and that this that's is what I, 
Yeah, that's what he, I always thought. He did, but I, I, yeah, I would have thought that Jackson would have, you know, the Jackson State would not have let that go. But that may have been I'm sure. That, I mean, that may have been the uh, the uh, the wedge there that forced them to do it. You know, but you would. I mean, it's such a lucrative. I mean, it's not just the Beatles that are in that Sony ATV thing. Sure. It's quite a. There's mm. quite a bit in there. Mm-hmm. Um, of course. So you know, I like I said, I you know, it's kind of interesting that they let it go, but you know, they did. So you know, what can you say? Mm-hmm. I but, have a, I have a couple of questions about this whole thing. Mm-hmm. First of all, um, since we're dealing with what was originally the Northern Songs catalog, that also includes the early George Harrison compositions, correct? Um, I, I don't want to. I don't want to. I don't want to go out on a limb. Possibly, just don't bother me. I, I think after that, he got his own. No, was, I yeah. think I think he kept up with Northern Songs even through Within You, Without You, and I think only towards the end of the Beatles did George start to get a different publisher for his songs. Well, I, but I don't want to. Again, I don't want to. I don't want to speculate. I do. I do. I was told, however, and Alan confirmed. You might be able to confirm this, that they uh, that uh, they don't own Penny Penny Lane. That somebody else owns Penny Lane. Really? Yeah. Really? There's somebody. Uh, there's some uh, some guy. I can't remember his name now. I did not mention him in the story. Uh, who actually owns Penny Lane? Huh? So. Yeah, I don't. Un- I, I I don't. Uh, uh, assuming that information is correct, but yeah. Uh, but anyway, uh, it's weird. Um, but the whole thing is, it, I mean, I, it's it's good that he's going to get at least some of them back. So, you know, just looking uh, this up, um, Harrison signed with Northern Songs in 1965 for a period of three years. So, hmm. only a Northern song is a Northern song. <laughs> okay, <laughs> right. There so we then, go. Then don't bother me is not if it, if That's he signed right. in 65. Yeah, so it was exactly okay. the opposite of what I asserted right here on our podcast. Yeah. Huh. Okay. It was a trick All question. Right. And, and then there's a, there's another issue here, which is, and correct me if I'm wrong here, if you own the publishing rights to your music, mm-hmm. don't you have to give permission if, let's just say, someone wants to use it in a commercial or mm-hmm. a Broadway show, um, or if someone wants to cover it? So in, in this case, let's just say someone wants to start a new Broadway show using Beatle music on Broadway in New York City. Mm-hmm. Wouldn't you need Paul McCartney's permission then to do that? Because then you're talking about the U.S. Right. So anything that applies to the U.S. So it's not just a matter of collecting money for the music publishing. It's also about giving rights to the songs, too. Right. I think, I, sure. I think we have a perform, armed performance rights and show rights, you know, that kind of show rights. Those are two separate issues. Performance rights are one thing. Anybody can perform a Beatles song. I mean, because you have bands doing them everywhere, you know, in bars every night. Right. As but long it, as, but, you know, as long ahead. as they're as long as they're registered to ASCAP or BMI or CSAC or, you know, whichever performance rights uh, organization, and then they pay they pay a fee. They can perform as many songs as they want by by anybody. But okay. uh, but yeah, but uh, but yeah, to get. Uh, to have those songs say in a in a as Ken was saying in a Broadway show, yeah, ob- definitely you'd have to get uh, um, have to get the legal legal permission of the uh, you know the copyright holder. Mm-hmm. Okay, no, hmm. no, which until now has been Sony and before that it, exactly. Uh, I mean, typically, exactly. I mean, I think what they've done simply out of politeness has been they've they've consulted with yes. you know because they don't want to they don't want to have a, a dispute going on between you know the Beatles and Sony if possible um, mm-hmm. so they've they've sort of worked together on that but of course if if you're if you own your own publishing then it's you know it's totally up to you and uh, it's your decision with recording I mean there's <laughs> there's this um, compulsory license where once a song has been recorded, um, you have to get a license to record it, but it's compulsory. So you, 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 the grounds on which you can deny someone a license are very few and far between. Yet it happens. I mean, for some, mm-hmm. I, I think it may be a question of whether you're going to rewrite the song or do something to it. Because didn't the Beatles object to the 
Beastie Boys doing I'm Down, or, or it was some something where they would not grant that compulsory license. I don't recall. Mm-hmm. I don't yeah, recall. I, that. Yeah, I vaguely you recall, recall that. I yeah. Mean, there, I mean, there have been some incredibly odd covers of the Beatles. I mean, I have some in my collection, and Alan, I'm sure you do too, mm-hmm. that are just absolutely dreadful. Mm-hmm. I mean, I can't imagine why they would pick on the BC boys when there are some horrible, and I may, I, I'm not talking about the, you know, the funny ones. I'm talking about the really, really dreadful ones. I mean, I don't know. What was the one we, we talked about on the show? Uh, layback. I mean, that, uh, I don't particularly think that's really good. Mm-hmm. And, and I, I mean, so they got permission and the BC boys wouldn't have, that doesn't make a whole lot of it, sense. It must have had to do with them wanting to rewrite the lyrics or something like that. That maybe, could be, maybe, yeah. Maybe, yeah, maybe mm. that, that that could very well be a be the problem there because, yeah, if they end up if they end up writing the lyrics or they end up doing something to it, sure, I'm sure they wouldn't want that. But mm, and okay. th- there's another issue here, which is mm-hmm. what about the Lennon side of things? Where does Yoko come into play? Now, I did read one article, and I don't know if it's accurate or not, that said something along the lines of 10 years after an artist dies, the music publishing, go if, if the artist didn't own the music publishing, the music goes to that artist automatically. Oh, now, in this case, so. since you're... No, well, because that, if that was the case, then he'd already no. have it. I mean, look yeah. at the, the Gershwin's catalog is still, you know, it's still administered by, um, mm-hmm. yeah. you know, it's, and, and long after they die. I mean, I, I remember wanting to quote a Gershwin song in a book I wrote about the violinist Misha Elman because he wrote a, a little known song called Misha, Yasha, Sasha and Tasha about all these Russian <laughs> Jewish violinists. And I wanted to quote that <laughs> lyric. And it was really hard to get permission, and Gershwin died in, you know, like 1936 or 37. Yeah, yeah. So, right. um, wow. Yeah. Did you finally get permission? No. No, I, mm. all, all I ended up doing was sort of um, summarizing what the song was about. I mean, it, it seemed to me that, you know, that song is so little known that this was only going to get them attention, but I wasn't willing to pay the exorbitant fee that they wanted to charge. I mean, oh my God. I could have got permission, but it meant, would have meant paying a lot. So, yeah, and wasn't that a song that probably would be maybe even by the time you did the article would have been PD? I would have I thought, would... you know. But you see, I yeah. mean, copyright law is so weird. I mean, yeah, you know, I really don't know. I mean, they there are things they can do. I mean, in a way, it's surprising that it's only fifty six years because there are some catalogs that people seem to manage to continually mm-hmm. renew. I mean, I, I think. Um, you know, if you want to do a Gershwin record now, you still have to go through the publishing and uh, Ab- absolutely. And so. Yeah, and, and look at the and look at the issue with with bootlegs, for example, where a lot of stuff you can, they can still go after you even past the fifty six year you know limit. Yeah, I mean, it's they just ra- didn't they just raise the the um, the bootleg limitation uh, a few years ago with the Digital uh, Rights Act. So uh, you know that. Whole there's a whole thing intertwined thing going on there, but um, I mean that's why they can still go. At, I mean you know for example you mean, if you were to, if you were to put out a, a a bootleg album for example as Frank Sinatra, the Sinatra family family would come after you. I mean there's no question about it. So I mean there's some things going on there. You know there, uh, the copyright issue and and the you know the the song, the songs themselves, issue. I think are two different things. I think I think so. Anyway, I could be wrong. So I just looked up the Beastie Boys thing, and it turns out that it wasn't the Beatles who objected, but Michael Jackson for some reason. Ah, uh-huh. there's a quote from one Ooh. of the Beastie Boys. One of the Beastie Boys saying, um, "Who does he think he is?" I could understand if Paul McCartney said no because it's his song, but Michael Jackson. I guess everybody should wear that stupid ass glove. <laughs> 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 this is one time we can probably thank Michael Jackson. Yay! <laughs> God. Anyway, anyway yeah. um, can we, can we clear up? Can, I'm sorry. Can we clear up this one thing about the Lennon side of things? Mm. I mean, where does where does Yoko come into play? I mean, if that's the case about the fi- uh, 56 years, wouldn't mm-hmm. she also get half of the Lennon McCartney catalog, the publishing of that too? She, you well, can't be saying that it apparently. all goes to Paul. 
She could yeah. apparently, but everyone seems to be talking just about Paul, and no one's really asking yeah. her. Yeah, right. But, um, you know, there have been some reports that she has made some deal with ATV Sony about the administration of the catalog through them, of, of her part of the catalog through them, um, which I guess is possible. I mean, I guess in a uh, where a, a situation where two people own the songs, each of them can have their royalties administered um the question would be well why wouldn't yoko want to own the publishing you know mm -hmm. why would she want someone else to administer it and we were saying before we went on that you know one one reason possibly could be that since paul has an apparatus for running publishing companies in place maybe mm -hmm. that's easier for him to do whereas perhaps yoko struck some sort of lucrative deal and doesn't have to do the administration you know Mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah, we don't. We, um, yeah, anyway. I'm just saying this because you don't hear anything about Yoko. No, <laughs> right now with this whole thing, it really yeah, is. Well, it really is funny. Um, because you know the people are bringing up all those old stories about how Paul didn't end up with it in the first place, and yeah. you know he had said at one point that he. I mean, his original story. You used to say this in interviews was that. He decided he wanted to buy it, but he thought he should buy it with Yoko because they were John songs too, and they wanted. To, he want, he thought they should go in together, and Yoko said, "No, no, I can get it for cheaper than than they're actually asking." And then Michael came in and swooped in and got it. Whether that's what actually happened or not, we don't really know. I mean, there are other stories circulating too, but. In any case, uh, there was there was one story I read this morning. It was you know it seemed a little silly to me. Um, they're saying that because it's Lennon and McCartney, once the rights revert back, they'll have to parse who wrote what and who gets what royalties. And but it doesn't work that way, you know. I mean, when a song is copyrighted, the people who copyright it are the composers of record, and it, and it doesn't take into account who wrote what word or who wrote the whole song, but has the other guy's mm -hmm. name on it. I mean, there's a there's a huge history of songs having other people's names on them. Um, sure. And, mm. uh, yeah, I don't think it works that way. But uh, unless, of course, Paul and Yoko were to sit down and say, okay, let's work this out now. I get yesterday, John gets strawberry fields, you know. But I think that mm. would really be a shame. I mean, you know what? It's the Lennon-McCartney songbook, and, and it should, I think – always be the Lennon McCartney songbook. Everybody who cares about it knows more or less who wrote what, but the deal that they had was the stuff they did, they published together. And I think that's the way it should be. Mm -hmm. yeah. It should be 50-50. Okay. 50-50 yeah, right. across the board. Anyway, mm -hmm. uh, actually, I've got a, I've got a little story, because I, I don't remember if you guys may have seen this. Back in the, I guess, the late 80s or early 90s, Paul appeared on uh, later with Bob Costas, which was the I guess probably the, the the NBC show that was on after the Tonight Show that right. before before Letterman uh, started, yeah. and uh, he um, at one point Costas showed him uh, a newspaper ad that had appeared that day for Maxwell House Coffee, which used the the lyrics from his portion of a day in the life, hmm. Hmm. you know, and, and Paul looked at it and he said, well, there you go. You know, it just does, uh, you know, just one of those things. And as the interview is going on, you can see Paul continuing to look at this newspaper ad and you can almost see the smoke starting to come, you know, <laughs> out of his ears. And at one point he said, you know, I wrote these words. <laughs> so you can tell at this point, because this was obviously after the whole, after Michael Jackson had swooped in and, and uh, gotten the ATV copyrights and all. And you, you could tell that it was, it was, it was still very much a, a source of, uh, it was a sore point with him. Mm-hmm. For sure. Yeah, many times Paul has said that he found it a bit galling that he has to pay Michael Jackson whenever he goes out and performs his own songs. Exactly. In the Beatle catalog. So yeah, it, it, irked, it irked him quite a lot. So mm -hmm. <laughs> anyway. it got under his skin. <laughs> Speaking of things in Beatle history, um, 
um, it came out this week that Simon Cowell is doing his own version of the Brian Epstein story. I, I mean, I don't know how many times we've heard about a movie version of the Brian Epstein story, and we have yet to see see one. But now we have two of them. We have the um, the Fifth Beetle, the Vectuari version that um, has the the uh, song rights, and we have the Cowell version that won't have song rights. And whether or not you know, the question is how long you know these things will take. I mean, it's it's like waiting for you know waiting for the next version the next volume of tune in i mean we've had we've had so many versions of we've had so many uh, you know uh i mean jude law alan benedict, mentioned benedict Dom- cumberbatch was right. going to play I mean, brian they're, they're, I mean, the only thing that the only things that have happened. Well, I, we we there was a film version, I think, on on the BBC a few years ago. But they they had the they did have the stage version in uh, in England recently. But I mean, it's crazy how long it's taken these things to happen. It's like why, you know, I don't know. It would be so funny if they all came out at the same time. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. <laughs> right. 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 But it's just it's you know. I just think that it's a great thing in a way that Brian is getting this attention now. Yes. I mean, we just we just saw that he made it into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, regardless of what our opinions are of the Hall of Fame. Mm-hmm. But just getting this kind of attention and this kind of, you know, respect, it, it, it's, it's so long overdue. Mm-hmm. And I'm just glad to see that there are projects in the works now. Mm-hmm. And Vivek Tawari's book did really well. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, the fact that I, I for one... And sometimes I'm guilty of this because there are a lot of artists out there in the music world besides the Beatles where I love their music and don't follow the history that well. But Mm -hmm. there are a lot of young people who are discovering the Beatles who may not know the whole history. And Mm -hmm. there's more to the Beatles than those four guys. And so as we, you know, we were talking about George Martin and I'm so glad that since his passing, there have been so, so many articles online about the massive contribution that he's made with the Beatles and with all the other recordings that he made. Mm-hmm. And Brian Epstein is the same story. Those two guys, without them, you probably wouldn't be talking right now about them. No, that's <laughs> true. So right. if, you, if there's any two people besides those four Beatles that we should be talking about, where we should have more books, more movies, Broadway shows, whatever, it mm-hmm. should be about Brian and about George Martin. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. No, no question about it. Yeah. yeah, yeah, And then we also. Oh, okay. I'm sorry, Al. I mean, interrupt. No, just just from a you know rooting interest uh, point of view. Uh, basically, as as a longtime opponent of American Idol and the shows mm-hmm. like that, basically, I'd be be rooting against anything that Simon Cowell is involved with, <laughs> and um, and probably rooting for. Uh, Vivek's uh, effort, because uh, as Ken mentioned, uh, the the book, this graphic uh, graphic novel, uh, the Fifth Beetle did you know did very well and has won awards. And of course, Vivek himself is an award winning producer, and, and all you know the, the resume as long as our arms on mm-hmm. broad on broad. And, it, and, it, and it's a great mm. book. I mean, it's a great book. It really, yeah. really is. I mean, it, yeah. That's what's what's really nice about it. I mean, there have been comic book treatments of the Beatles story before, but this was actually very well done. And yeah. and so I'm, you know, from that standpoint, it's a great it's a great thing. And and you know, it's just like I said, it's a question of when we will see, you know, the movies. That's the big question. And how you know, mm. it's long. We're long overdue. That's the thing. So hey, hey, Steve. Yeah. You said that the Vivek Tuari film has the song rights. Does that mean they're going to have Beatle recordings in them or just yes. other artists covering the yes. Beatles? They have the Beatle rights. They have the rights wow. to the Beatles songs. Well, that speaks volumes right there. Right. I mean, you've got to get the backing of Apple to do that. So, <laughs> you know, it shows, yes. um, you know, how much they think of this project. Mm-hmm. Right. So. And how much uh, and, and – I guess you could say how much they don't think of Kyle. Well, Kyle's doing a different, you know, going in a different uh, way. I mean, the two of them up until just recently were working together and now they're not. So, 
Mm. Because uh, Vivek's project is now going to TV. It's going to be a miniseries. So that's the difference there. So mm. it'll mm, be okay. interesting. And then we also had today Sean Lennon announcing he was touring. Uh, can I, before we get into the Sean Lennon touring, because I, uh, uh, but uh, can we stop coming up with Beatles 2 and people saying everything that the Beatles sons are doing is is an extension of the Beatles because that thing with James McCartney um, and and uh, Danny uh, Harrison Danny working together I mean please let's stop that I mean th- th- this is not Beatles 2 it, it is under there's no way in hell it's going to be anything be, you know anything Beatles 2 it just so happens that the two of them are working together but you know, you are you already have. I've already seen two stories, two tabloid stories, to that effect, and it and it really just irks me to no no end because people pick up on it and they they believe it. It's just it's ridiculous. Mm-hmm. You, know? you mean this idea of all the Beatle kids reunite, not reunite, the Beatle kids getting together and right. forming a group, that kind of thing? Yes. Yeah. It's uh, well, we've had those stories a couple, at least a couple of times, and it's it just. It really angers me to see that because it's stupid. They well, they would they would never do. Julian would never do it. Danny wouldn't do anything like that. The only reason he's getting together with James would be because he wants to. And this, you know, I mean, even and if Sean and and Julian work together, that would be the only reason. It would have nothing it'd have nothing to do with, you know, any kind of trying to live off the Beatles' legacy. I mean, that's just stupid. Yeah, and you know. They have enough to deal with in handling their own careers. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And they're, they're always compared to their fathers anyway. Can you imagine if they formed a group and oh, to be compared please. to the Beatles? It yeah. would be an immediate disappointment. The, mm-hmm. the actual idea that just because they have the same genes, that it's going to be yeah. you know, the same thing of equal quality or whatever. The only thing that they can do is be themselves. And you're going to find some similarities between the Beatle kids and their parents <laughs> It's just natural. You're going to hear it in their voices. Sometimes you'll hear it in the music, in the compositions. They mm-hmm. just The only way they're ever going to survive is if they are themselves and the public likes what they're doing uh, of, of, what, of what is them, what is really them. You know, if the only reason why you're following the Beatles' kids is because they're the sons of, at some point you can lose interest very quickly. <laughs> yeah. You yeah. know? And I, I actually am very fascinated with the Beatle kids. I find them all to be very talented in their own way. But I'm the last person to make comparisons, you know. And it really pissed me off, to tell you the truth. All the people that uh, listened to my show through the years who only seem to care about Julian Lennon because he's John's son or because yeah. he sounds like John. Then I'll say, what do you think of the music? Listen to the music. Do you like it? Forget about the fact of who he is. You know, and I really do mm-hmm. like the music of the Beatle kids. But there's nothing wrong with initially you have an interest in them because of who they are. But for it to be a prolonged interest, they have to establish identities all their own. And they're also very different from each other anyway. So that's that's what keeps me interested in them. And I, I do believe that they're all talented in their own way. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, you know, the, as far as, uh, you know, the people that immediately assume that just because they're, you know, that they're, they're their sons, that they're, you know, automatically inherit all of their musical brilliance, not to speak ill of the recently deceased, but I always say that the, the, the three words that could, you know, combat any of that are Frank Sinatra Jr. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Who? Oh, that's a good. That's a good point. Who that's was? Very- you know, who was? I mean, not a fraction. Who didn't have a fraction of the talent of his of his father, even though he was basically molded into a a clone of him, and and indeed, <laughs> in his last years, after you know, after his father uh, passed, uh, was basically going out as a. Uh, you know, uh, kind of a Sinatra substitute, mm-hmm. and not and not doing it very well. If you've ever watched uh, any of um, the clips on YouTube, mm. you know, yeah. so so it's uh, you know it's not an automatic thing that the that the son automatically inherits the talents of the father. Mm-hmm. But it's also very hard to assess the work of a kid when if you automatically make a comparison. Yes. So and that's mm-hmm. that's what they have to deal with, and it's not yeah. just. 
the Beatles songs. It's any any musician, any actor who has famous uh, have siblings mm-hmm. that uh, everything is compared to, and it's just yeah. not fair to do that. Mm-hmm. People do it, you know. It, it's it's probably never going to end that people make the comparisons, but um, you got to judge these artists on their own merit, and yeah. uh, you know. Yeah. So speaking yep. of Sean, then, so which, which was the the topic. You know, I've I found Sean's stuff really good, and um, I've seen him perform as well. You know, backing his mom, and he is a really good guitarist, a really good, um, actually, multi instrumentalist. Mm-hmm. I actually knew someone who was his music teacher when he was a little kid. I mean, a really little kid. Um, oh, really? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Who had, at the time, I believe, he was learning saxophone, and he said, huh. and he had said then that he was really talented, that he was like his, you know, one of his best students, and you know, and not because he was Sean. So, you know, he he very clearly has talent, and um, you know, what he's doing now, I, I don't know whether the tour is the tour with Les Claypool or with yeah. Ghost of a, okay. Yes, it's, it's you know, Claypool. So that in itself is, is kind of interesting because Les Claypool is also a, you know, a, a, a sort of a going concern, you know, with Primus and, uh, you know, that's a, that's a band that has a following is, you know, not huge, but is, you know, moderately big. And, you know, they've uh, found some common ground to work together. And I, and I think that says something as well. You know, I don't know that Sean necessarily needed that validation because I think he's put out a, enough music of his own that um, that we can see that he's got the goods. But um, I think it's it's just interesting to see that you know he has this kind of collaboration going on. And Ghost of a Saber Tooth Tiger, I think, is a really pretty good band too. Um, mm-hmm. So um, yeah, I, I think it's kind yeah. of interesting. With Sean, uh, as we were saying in, in a previous show. His music is all over the place. I mean, he mm-hmm. he made an album mm-hmm. called Friendly Fire, which was very poppy, mm-hmm. very Beatley, and, and very reminiscent of John. But if you followed what Sean has said in his in his interviews, he's very influenced by the Beatles, and he loved Brian Wilson as an artist, very big influence. But then he loves a lot of the, you know, the the hard edge, um, you know, what's the word? Alternative. Alternative. Sorry, mm-hmm. uh, music that's out there. <laughs> And so he can go in either direction. He's really all over the place there musically. So I, I sometimes like to say that whereas Julian uh, is, is very influenced, I think, by, by John and a lot of other influences. He used to talk about jazz and Steely Dan and Keith Jarrett and people like that. Sean is more a product of John and Yoko because Sean is very much very supportive of Yoko's work. Mm-hmm. And you can tell that in, in, in the music that he's done with... Um, the alternative artist that he works with. So he continues in both, both different uh, genres, more mainstream and more alternative at the same time. He can go in either direction. So uh, he, he's fascinating to watch. And, and like you said, Alan, he's a great musician. Mm-hmm. I've seen him play you know, guitar and drums. He plays drums really well, too, and piano. Yeah, and, and so, Claypool, Claypool was talking about the fact that Sean plays drums for the uh for their collaboration which which i thought was interesting yeah i've seen i've seen sean with yoko uh myself and yeah he he was really good so and also he doesn't really push himself into the public eye he just follows his heart and does whatever he wants to in the moment and every now and then he'll publicize himself but he doesn't really go gangbusters at getting publicity for himself really well so. i mean with with ghosts they they kind of did and then he he and yoko went out on the fracking Thing and they were kind of, you know, I mean, from that standpoint, they were they were trying to get publicity, but um, well, that was for a cause. That was for a cause right. too. Yeah, oh. right. But it wasn't as much about Sean as it was about the cause of fracking. Cause, so. sure. Oh, yeah, that's true. That's true. Anyway, um, and we also have Paul g- getting ready to go out on tour. Um, they're still announcing shows, and there are probably going to be a few more shows to be announced. Although it would seem that most of the American shows have been announced. I don't think this is going to be that extensive. I think everybody's kind of hoping he's going to hit every city in the world, but it's not going to happen. And well, I, feel I, like, I believe he announced the other Portland by mistake, but they're going to have to clear that up and have him come here. <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, the, does Paul know that you've moved, Alan? Because if he does know, then you know he'll he'll book a date there. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure he he uh, follows me on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. No doubt. <laughs> Well, I mean, Yo- doesn't Yoko follow you? Um, yeah, probably. Actually, I mean, well, Yoko, Yoko, Yoko uh, sent my Christmas card up here this year, so so she knows where I am. She'll tell him. See, cause <laughs> Yoko, Yoko follows me. Mm-hmm. She does. I'm, I'm serious. She does. But anyway, that's. Been, <laughs> I'm sorry. Never mind. Um, um, but yeah, so that, that's starting, and it'll be interesting. I know we'll we'll talk about what they'll be changing in the. Um, in the set list when that happens. Um, You're you know, seeing the to... first show, aren't you? I'm, I'm hoping to. Yeah. I'm, I've, I'm working on it. We'll see. I'm working on covering it. So we'll see what happens there. Yeah, but you know, it's kind of, it's kind of interesting. You've got Paul, Ringo, Sean, and James all touring, mm-hmm. you know, pretty much mm-hmm. the same time. Mm-hmm. Who knew that yep. Danny would be such a layabout? <laughs> I know. <laughs> I know, I know. Anyway, It'll be um, around. yeah. Um, for the second half of the show, we're gonna we're gonna um, we're gonna just throw out little questions. And Ken, you you had a question you were gonna you were gonna hit all three of us with. So I'll let you go ahead and start. Yeah, I was curious because one thing all four of us have in common is mm-hmm. that uh, despite our love for the Beatles, none of us ever got to see the Beatles as a group live. Right. We've all seen them as solo artists, but we've never seen them live. So I was curious in asking all three of you this question. Mm -hmm. If you had your choice, if you can transport yourself back in time and pick one concert that the Beatles did together, and you could be there, if you had your choice, what would it be? Now, I should also point out that if you want it to be when Pete Best was with them, that's fine. Or Stu Sutcliffe. If you want it to be uh, the Quarrymen days, when when John, Paul, and George were together, that's fine, Mm -hmm. too. But any part of their history when they were together, and I'd be curious to know, amongst the three of you, if you had your choice, which concert, and it doesn't even have to be a specific concert. It could be the Beatles at the Cavern, if you want. It could be a venue, you know, if you had your choice, and and why. What would you pick? Hmm. So, why don't we... That's a great question. Why don't we start with Al? I'm going to go with something that we talked about, or that Billy Billy J talked about last week, mm. and and it's a historic kind of turning point concert in in Beatles history, and that's their appearance at Litherland, Litherland Town Hall in Liverpool uh, shortly after they returned from their first trip to uh, to Germany to Hamburg. Their first mm-hmm. season of of, uh, of playing in Hamburg, and that's always been kind of looked on as the kind of the turning point of their of their apprenticeship, and for Billy J, uh, totally without any uh, sort of encouragement to bring that up and talk about that that was you know what a great show that was. Mm-hmm. Uh, that would have been that would have been something really special to see. I have a feeling. And it was with so, Stu and Pete. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's true. Mm-hmm. So, uh, so I would, I would go with that one. Okay. Well, I was, I was going to go with that. That was one. the first time. That was the first time that Billy saw the Beatles in concert. That's, yeah. that's right. Yeah. So, I was going to go. I was going to go with that, except for one thing that I maybe when I remind Al, he may change and pick another. Um, ah. I'm sure you've you've read the descriptions in Mark's book about what the atmosphere was like in in terms of oh you know, yeah. uh <laughs> so are we going back to these concerts as you know invisible and you know <laughs> yeah, or yeah, are we exactly. subject yeah. to the wearing same the, you know wearing, wearing beating up, beatings up that everybody <laughs> else <was. laughs> uh, no i'm invisible <laughs> okay in the ether <laughs> <laughs> with a tape recorder yeah exactly mm. video mm. right Right, with all the technology so, we have now, but uh, being invisible and but there. <laughs> so, Alan, you would pick Litherland too? Well, um, now that I don't have to pick Litherland because Al mentioned it, um, I would go you with. Can. A, well, uh, we might as well have some variety. So, um, I think that, you know, of the things that, uh, of the shows that we have seen 
on video. The, um, the one that I think probably would have been even better live because it was already one of the best on video might have been Paris 65. Yeah. Would need, of course, a really close seat. Um, but and and invisibility, but uh, you know right. they were very very tight in that show, and it was a really good show. And it's uh, you know you're talking about basically the same show as Shay, except I think you know a much more controlled setting. And uh, mm -hmm. you know I I I bet that would have been incredible to be at. Very interesting. Yeah. How about you, Steve? I'd have to say Hamburg. Mm. Uh, you know I, I I keep listening to the to the the uh, star club stuff and and i love that and i have to i mean even more than litherland and and the cavern i you know the the raw energy of those star club tapes is just so nice and i would like to be able to hear it not so distant you know not as distant as the uh as the tapes we have as uh the tapes uh that we have are so i i'd start i'd say star club so do you want but the Star with, Club of the tapes or yeah. the previous years when they were yeah, perhaps wilder question. but didn't have Ringo? Yeah. Um, that's a good question. Um, yeah, probably, probably a little earlier, although, you know, I mean, Ringo really is not much of a uh, factor in that Star Club session. There, you know, uh, so I guess it wouldn't make any difference, but probably earlier when they were wilder, you know. Uh, but I mean, they were pretty wild on that on that Hamburg tape as it is. So it's hard to, you know, I mean, uh, between John swearing and all that stuff. So, but at the same time, as they got better and better as a live act, you would think that maybe you'd want to see them at the end of their Hamburg days mm -hmm. at the Star Club. I mean, I'm sure yeah. they were probably a lot better then than when they played the Indra. Right. Oh, yeah. You know, right. So. Well, well I, didn't say, I didn't say the Indra either, so okay. <laughs> there we go. There we go. So, Ken? Uh, all right. Yeah, um, actually, I, I would agree with Steve. Um, I would find it really fascinating to see them in any of the Hamburg venues. And, and uh, if I had to pick one, probably the Star Club, because they would have been at their best the end of 1962. But also... Because of the fact that you've heard that they went and played for eight hours a night mm -hmm. with yeah. some breaks in between. So, you know, you would have heard some songs that I'm sure that they would have duplicated, but some songs that would have been entirely new. Some songs they might have played only once. Some songs they might have played three times. It would have been fascinating to know what their entire set list was for an entire night. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm sure it was those same songs that were on the Star Club, but there might have been other songs, too. Right. You know, so just to know that and to keep going on throughout the whole night. Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously, this is all with the knowledge of what they became later. If you lived back in those days and you didn't know what was to happen with the Beatles, you mm -hmm. might you might only stay there for an hour. <laughs> you know, yeah. but knowing what we know now, if you had a whole night of just watching this band do one set list, set list after another and um, just to see how they interacted with each other, uh, the looseness of the band in Hamburg and also the tightness too, and how they gel right. as a band mm -hmm. to, to see both of those at the same time. And just to, to witness the different set lists would have been fascinating to me. I agree with you completely. Yeah. Because that would be, that would have been, that would have been really cool to hear all the stuff, stuff. That I'm, well, I mean, this, the, the, the really interesting thing would have been the songs that they haven't done since, you know, that we know nothing about. And those would have been, it would have been interesting to, to hear some of those too. So, yeah. Anyway. Well, I, sometimes I've said here on this show how much I love Mark Lewison's book, The Beatles Live. And mm -hmm. one of the reasons why I love that book is because you see the songs year to year of what they did live, what, what Mark right. could prove they used to do, whether they did them once or whether they did it repeatedly. But um, I find that stuff fascinating. Just knowing what they used to do live in the early years and even in the early 60s. And once they finally had their record contract, what songs of the ones mm -hmm. they covered, they chose to pick when they had so many other songs they could have mm -hmm. picked from. I find that more fascinating now than I ever have. Well, I was going to ask Alan. Alan, you may know the answer to this. Is Mark going to update Beatles Live? He's not, is he? There, I thought I had heard he was going to do that. Update Beatles Live? Um, yeah, but Beatles. Um, I don't believe so. Uh, that's interesting, though. You know, he's yeah. always yeah. talked about having a website as well that would go with the book, and I kind of 
had hoped that that would start with volume one and it doesn't seem to have, mm. but um, possibly by the later volumes when the book industry itself is a little bit more dead, um, <laughs> it will be important to him to have a website where all that stuff is, is updated. I, I, I know it's something he wanted to do and probably just sort of got overcome by uh, events and, you know, right. and the need to get finished. But uh, otherwise, yeah, that would make a lot of sense because he's found out so much more stuff you know, since right. then. Um, mm. right. And that was a good book that nobody can find, you know, unless you yeah. got it when it was out. That's it's true. really hard to come by. So, uh -huh. yeah. I look at it all the time. Yeah. When yeah. I do my research yeah. right, for my show. It's, it's, so, yeah, yeah, definitely. Definitely. All right. I'll ask my, let me ask my question then. Um, and this is next to your question, Ken. This is pretty simplistic, but um, what Beatle album do you, think you have the most copies of <laughs> oh my god <sighs> and it can be so it can be solo too um but which one uh let me start with uh al i'm gonna put you on the spot first hmm. <laughs> it might be rubber soul i'm not sure uh okay i mean it's just a, we're just this is we're just kind of throwing it off the top because obviously, I you know, um, it's one of the first ones that I bought as an import, mm -hmm. you know, plus having had the American one. Uh, I still have the the Japanese box from from the early 80s and then all the CD iterations and all. So, yeah, uh, just as a as a, oh, there's probably probably others that I have just as many copies of. But um, yeah, I, I would say just as just as a, a, a stab in the dark, I would say Rubber Soul. Okay, Ken. This is a tough question because I yeah. never counted how I never <laughs> I didn't, counted. How I didn't many think copies it was that of, hard. <laughs> well, it's just that every single time an album's been updated in some way, yeah. or the, the sound has been improved, and I just I buy that. It's all kind of equal to me. Mm. You know, every time a Beatle or a solo Beatle album gets remastered. Then I buy that copy. You know, it's 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 I don't know. I think they're all pretty much the same. I suppose, uh, you know, there have been instances when I've gone to a local record store and bought Beatle albums that I already had many times over for a buck, <laughs> you know, just yeah. so I can have one for a dollar. You know, right. and uh, so there's a lot of, um, you know, of the American albums that I probably have four or five copies of just for that reason, like Meet the Beatles. You know, I know I have a lot of copies of that one. Uh, probably have a lot of copies of Sgt. Pepper for that reason, just so I can yeah. say I bought it for a dollar. But it's not like I'm, I would say that I, that I played all those albums. I probably played the original ones that I bought from the very beginning and stayed on those until I got a better sounding copy. Right. You know, mm -hmm. and I was never one to go and buy, you know, all the Japanese albums and all the British albums. Right. Once, once the, the CDs came out in 1987, that's, I became converted to a CD fan. Yep. Mm -hmm. So that's just how it was. I mean, I do have a few import copies, but, you know, once it became more uh, established that this is the way the Beatles released it as they did in England, I became more devoted to that. And that's, that became the way that I listened to the Beatles music more so than the American releases. But I've got a lot of copies of Meet the Beatles, I know, and Sgt. Pepper. So those would probably be my top two. Okay. Okay. Mm. Uh, Alan? I'm pretty sure for me it, it probably is Pepper. Um, just because offhand I have the UK mono and the UK stereo, the US mono and the US stereo. I have a pressing on Apple. I have um, at least one foreign pressing of some kind, probably German. Um, there were at least two picture discs that came out of that and I've got those and and that may be what puts it over the others because uh, I, I'm not mm. sure I have many other picture discs yeah. the mobile fidelity sound lab um, I have mm. the big box set and I have pepper separately and I have the UHQR I was gonna I was gonna ask you if you had that one yes that was one on you know very heavy vinyl and uh, you know before they were doing that uh, maybe more than I'm sure it's more than 180 grams but um, that's 
it's quite nice. So, so there's like, you know, three mobile fidelity versions right there. Then in 1987, when the CDs came out, I had the American one, but then the British one came with a slip case and a larger mm -hmm. format booklet. So I got that. Mm -hmm. Then the HMV shop put out a separate Sgt. Pepper box, so I got that. Oh, then yeah. the HMV <laughs> shop put out the whole run of 1987 CDs with a hologram of a toy of Ringo's drum set on the cover. And, of course, I had to have that. So <laughs> that, all those have pepper in them. And then there's the 2009 CDs. <laughs> <laughs> so plus – um, I've got, you know, official paid for downloads. Well, I have no idea why, but, um, but I got the 2009 or 2010 when they put it on iTunes, I got the whole mm -hmm. set. So if that counts, so, um, yeah, I think they definitely, um, should have given me green stamps for my Sergeant Pepper collection really? alone. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Just more, Woo. I've got more copies of Sergeant Pepper than there are Beatles records. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> wow. I would also have to say Pepper, only because uh, when I used to hit the the vinyl stores in uh, Berkeley, which is about an hour from here, um, one of them used to have, this was years ago, obviously, used to have records for a dollar. And I picked up all sorts of, uh, and I used to just go through and pull all the Beatle albums. And um, I got n numerous copies of pepper that way imports uh mostly mostly domestic though but i do remember one time picking up one years before the mono version was uh released here a mono copy of i believe the first uh white album but that was uh, uh Neither here nor there, but I think I'm pretty sure it's Pepper. I did also, I do also remember picking up at that particular record store a an A track, uh, a Sgt. Pepper A, or no, a Hollywood Bowl A track that had the, I believe the song titles mixed up or something. Uh, they uh, there were a couple of A tracks that came out that uh, had the song titles uh, the the order changed. Oh uh, yeah, but, uh, but, well they they did that a lot with the A tracks, right? Right. Yeah, they did. Mm. they did. But but I'd have to say Pepper because that seemed to be the one that uh, used to pop up in the record racks uh, more often. Um, anyway. Hey, Alan, I have a question. Mm -hmm. Alan, did you also collect the Beatles music on cassette and A-track too, or was it strictly vinyl to oh, CD? Yes, I believe I have at least one Sgt. Pepper cassette. <laughs> <laughs> what was I thinking? Uh -huh. <laughs> I didn't really – I didn't collect it. On those formats, I happen I happen to have ended up with I think a complete run of the cassettes, but I've got no eight tracks. So um, yeah, there mm -hmm. you, as you see, I've I've been remiss. You have. There were versions of Pepper yeah. that I could still get. <laughs> That's true. Do you know I I did not I was not a big picture disc uh, collector. I did not like picture discs that much. I thought they were pretty much a waste of time. It's strictly but, for for a collector and nothing else. Oh yeah. I mean, I wouldn't play the disc. Yeah, see, <laughs> I that would was, just own that, it just, and display it, you know. See, that was probably the reason why I was never really into it because I was into, you know, hearing the different mixes and stuff that were, were coming out on vinyl. So I just didn't bother a whole lot with. I mean, I have a couple, but I don't have that many. I didn't make a point of going crazy with those. I never did. Mm. But um, yeah. Al, 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 you did you have a question you wanted to throw well, out at us? Well, yeah, as a matter of fact, by extension, what is – since, well, the three three of us are of a comparable age, Ken's younger. Mm -hmm. So so his – actually, his will probably be more interesting. But what was your first Beatles album? Which, uh -huh. you know, which was your first Beatles album purchase? Okay. And, well, that was, uh, yeah. Steve, why don't we start with you? Yeah, that, I mean, that's pretty easy for me because – although I didn't – buy the first copy i mean my sister got the first copy of meet the beatles because we bought it i believe just before the the sullivan show but i think my first one was probably the second album mm -hmm. uh, either that or introducing i can't remember which one but it was one of those real early ones because i mean you know we were we were doing it then so um but i can't i i it, it's hard for me to remember to be sure and you know, and a lot of that stuff, you know, I just don't, I don't have anymore. So, 
I'm yeah, sure. sure. But I yeah. believe I would have to say either introducing it's probably probably introducing. I think, I mm -hmm. think, so. Oh, actually, it might have been if you count the uh, the fake ones. The uh, you know the Beatles. Well, Beatles. not the fake one, not Beetle Rama or one of the. Yeah. Other ones. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, no, I it was probably introducing. Yeah, although it probably would be, would be fun to find out who played those. You know the Beetle Rama and those those fake albums. You know if there was anybody on on those records that later became a noter, you know, a notable musician. Didn't Elton John do a couple of Beatles songs you know, for one of those? Because he was doing, was it Hallmark? Well, or I, don't whatever he, it was. I don't think he did Beatles songs, but he did covers yeah, yes. of a lot of like contemporary hits mm -hmm. uh, when he was when he was still working in publishing. You know, before he got uh, the contract with Phillips in in England, right? Right, Ken? Uh yeah, I'm pretty sure. I, there's there's an album of just covers, yeah. right. Of him, you know, signed, sealed, delivered. He covered. Yeah. I have to, you know, I have to look up all the song titles, but it's interesting just to hear Elton. You know, this is what he did early on, and he was good at what he did. They were just, mm -hmm. you know, they were passable, and it's just good right. to hear him, you know, sing those songs. But yeah, I I do have uh, some of that material. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Alan, what was your first Beatles purchase? Um, well, I had an uncle who gave us a copy of Meet the Beatles early on, um, but <clears throat> I wasn't really buying records much in those days. I um, had a very minuscule allowance and was spending it on other mm -hmm. stuff. And uh, so the first one that I went out and bought myself was not until yesterday and today. It's pretty wow. late, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Mm. You know how many copies of that I now have? <laughs> <laughs> right, with or without the butcher cut. <laughs> um, three of them have butcher covers. <laughs> uh, was the first them... one you bought a butcher cover? No, alas. Um, although I do know um, a girl who had bought one that had a butcher cover and a week later brought it back because she wanted the same cover all her friends had. That must oh, be killing oh. her now. But, uh, <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah, so oh. the things you do as a kid. But, yeah. Um, yeah, yesterday and today. It's, uh, I, I then made up for my tardiness, however. <laughs> yes, you did, in a big way. Mm. <laughs> Ken, Ken, did you get... Go ahead. Uh, no, um, my answer is not all that more interesting because I do remember the first Beatle record I owned was definitely Meet the Beatles as, as an album. I do remember buying Love Me Do as a single. Uh, it was the first single I ever bought, and it was 49 cents back then. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, on the yellow tally label. Mm -hmm. But I do remember as an album, uh, Meet the Beatles, I had. You know, I was bitten by the bug as soon as I heard I Want to Hold Your Hand. So I was listening to all the early stuff back then, even though I'm born in 1959. I still, uh, you know, I, I, I love the Beatles from the moment I heard I Want to Hold Your Hand. So um, I do recall getting uh, the Beatles' second album at a Sam Goody store where it was a Code C, <laughs> which, I, <laughs> which I think was either $249 or $299. I'm trying to remember um, uh, that's, I remember getting that and buying that. That's the first I remember buying so maybe Meet the Beatles was a gift to me. I don't remember. But I did have Meet the Beatles before the Beatles' second album. So, yeah. But I always remember going into a, a little record store getting Love Me Do as a single. That was my very first single. And I still have it. That same copy. It's in very bad shape, though. Yeah. <laughs> I wore that one out. So, okay. uh, yeah. My, oh. my, my first Beatles album purchase was uh was actually a hard day's night uh this was just after i graduated from eighth grade and had uh, you know graduation money to to spare and uh went into uh a, a store called model's shoppers world in lodi sure. new jersey in lodi uh -huh. new jersey <laughs> and um and they had just gotten and this is uh, th this is why the date that I've always seen for the American release of a Hard Day's Night is absolutely wrong because this was this was around June fifteenth, and uh, and they had they had a Hard Day's Night 
and I and I picked up my copy then. And, um, you know, because I think the, the date, I think they still list the date sometime in July or something like that. I forget what the exact date is that um, is, is listed. But it was definitely available as of, as of June 15th. Yeah, that was that, that was my that was my first one. And uh and I I actually didn't get either Meet the Beatles or the Beatles second album I think until sometime that summer. Hmm. Yeah. Wow. You were in dying to get Meet the Beatles and the Beatles second album no. as they came out? No, because I was a uh, cuz I was actually a convert. I actually resisted for about a month uh because I thought you know, when I first heard, you know, when on the night of uh, January 7th, 1964, when, you know, out of nowhere, this record that I had never heard before is the number one record on WABC and sounded like it was something out of, a, you know, from another planet. Um, my original reaction was negative. And then when, like, you know, basically the next day, there's all these girls at school going crazy over this group that they had never hadn't heard of a week before. You know, it. Uh, I guess the 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 even the young curmudgeon in me hmm. uh, sort of came out, and uh, so I I resisted. And actually, the, the, it was it was their performances on the Ed Sullivan Show, uh, particularly the show from Miami, that won me over. So it wasn't, you know, it wasn't the, you know, wasn't all the hype and it wasn't all the promotion and all it was, you know, it was their, you know, their own musical ability and, and magnetism that, uh, that won me over. And in fact, the, the following week went out and bought the three, the three singles that were available at the time. You know, I want to hold your hand. She loves you and please, please me. And, but I didn't get a Beatles album until, as I said, until that June. Hmm. Wow. Wow. You know, it's it's kind of fascinating in a way when you listen to the order in which people buy things, you know. Yeah. There could be there are a lot of people who may have listened to the Beatles or gotten to the Beatles first from what they did in the late 60s mm -hmm. and then they did then they discovered the early stuff and their reaction could be very different from people who listen to everything chronologically. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing with people who got into the Beatles through the solo music first because that's sure. a very different experience. And mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's just interesting to hear different perspectives that way. Because I know a lot of people that got into the Beatles first through the solo stuff. Mm -hmm. And then they discovered the group. So, you know. Those are the younger those are the younger Beatles fans. <laughs> they're not they're not that young now. No, they're <laughs> not. No, I know, I know that. And I said that I'm saying that with tongue in cheek and knowing that yeah. knowing that you would react to that. We um, wanted to make note of a couple of things. Number one, um, for those of you that hear us on fab4radio.com, we are now on every day at 6 p.m. ET, and we thank Matt at Fab 4 Radio for that. So but you can hear us every single day at, at 6 p.m. ET. And, so that means uh, that the name of the show is going to be changed to Things We Said Today and every, Tomorrow every day. and the day after that. and <laughs> Things We Said Every Day. Yes, things, there, we, there go. we go. Things we said every day. Okay. So there, we, there we are. Um, or, or since it's at six p.m., it would be things we say every things we said every night. That's true too. Good. I like yeah. that. We yeah, got solo music in now. Right. As, as Matt uh, made a point to tell me, uh, we're on eight days a week now. So, and we are. And we also also want to get in a tribute to Keith Sluchansky, who passed away this week. I can't. I haven't met him, but I know Alan. You knew him very well. Mm -hmm. um, and Al, I, I, did you know him too, Al? Uh, very peripherally, just you know, because he worked at several, worked and or owned, uh, managed uh, several stores in Greenwich Village, uh, several of which I used to, uh, you know, which I was a customer. So I knew him basically as the guy, the guy behind the counter. But Alan knew him much better. Ken, yeah. you knew him also, correct? I met him several times at Revolver Records, which oh, okay. is really where I came to know him, and I bought a lot of stuff there. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we, we, we always talk Beatles. He yep. always told me uh, some interesting items out on the market or what was about to come out, and uh, it's a real nice guy and uh, yeah. really shocked to hear about his passing. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I, I also 
had contact with him and I was, yeah, we were all really, really shocked and, and we want to give our condolences to his family. Um, he was, a, he was a really nice guy. So, um, that said, um, we are about out of time. Um, we want to thank you all for being with us again. Uh, we hope you will be back with us for our next show next week and catch us every day on Fab Four Radio or on YouTube or on, on Pure Pod- Pop Radio. Uh, Pure Pop Radio um, on iTunes. We're, we're all over. You can catch us everywhere. Um, we're on, uh, we have uh, a couple pages on Facebook. We have the show page and a group page. And we'd love to hear from you at our email address, things we said today, radio show at gmail.com. You can all, you can get a hold of us, uh, each of us online through Facebook, uh, through our own personal pages. We're always there. I know Al daily posts 50 year um, items. Um, <laughs> that he, almanac, almanac type stuff. Almanac type stuff. Yep. Yeah. And, um, we're, yeah, we're all out there, and we'd love to hear from you. Uh, we've gotten some great comments. Actually, there were a couple of com- great comments about the um, about the fantasy shows that we did, and um, we're going to try and, uh, uh, you know, we'll, we're definitely going to look at those. Um, uh, Tom, I hope I pronounced this right, Aguirre uh, really liked the Jude Kessler show. Like I said, at the fantasy show, the McCartney show, got a lot of, Got a lot of commentary. Um, mm. Somebody asked me. Uh, somebody asked, uh, "How come we didn't mention Denny Lane?" And I wrote back and I said, "I mentioned Denny Lane." And somebody else uh, said uh, they agreed that uh, Todd Rundgren would be an excellent choice as a collaborator for Paul. Um, mm. But uh, there were there were all sorts of all sorts of great suggestions. Somebody that we've been getting suggestions for future shows, and we will definitely take a look at those. So. Please feel free to write us to talk to us on Facebook, and and uh, and we'll be glad to to come back to you. We are not uh, we are not shy <laughs> about talking <laughs> talking to you. That's for that's for sure. Anybody uh, got any got any uh, quick things to say before we sign out of here, guys? Uh, just one thing. You you meant, uh, was that Tom Tom Aguilar? Uh, A G U I A R. No, it's Aguirre, I believe it is. Not. Aguilar. Oh, okay. So okay. I was, so it's not the Tom of uh, uh, Octopus's Garden fan scene. I don't I think, think that's who I, it is. I think you that's think who it, is? it is. Yeah. If it is, yes, I'm pretty it, sure. Yeah. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Ah, um, if it is, Tom, there's your plug. <laughs> <laughs> there, yeah. There you go. Yeah. It's, I, I believe it's Aguirre. It's not Aguilar. And I'm because I'm looking right at the mail, so I hope I'm pronouncing that right. But there, there we go. Uh, anyway, okay. Until next week, for Ken and Alan and Al, this is Steve Marinucci saying thank you very, very much for listening, and we will see you next time. Mm-hmm.